Chapter 91, The Pequod Meets the Rosebud In vain it was to rake for amber grease in the paunch of this leviathan, unsufferable feeder denying not inquiry. Sir T. Brown, V.E. It was a week or two after the last whaling scene recounted, and when we were slowly sailing over a sleepy, vapory midday sea, that many noses on the Pequod's deck proved more, villagent, more vil vigilant discoverers than three pairs of eyes aloft. A peculiar and not very pleasant smell was smelt in the sea. I will bet something now, said Stubb, that somewhere hereabouts are some of those drugged whales we tickled the other day. I thought they would keel up before long. Presently the vapors in advance slid aside, and there in the distance lay a ship, whose furled sails betokened that some sort of whale must be alongside. As we glided nearer, the stranger showed French colors from his peak, and by the eddying cloud of vulture seafowl that circled and hovered and swooped around him, it was plain that the whale alongside must be what, a fi what the fishermen call a blasted whale, that is a whale that has died unmolested on the sea, and so floated an unappropriated corpse. It may well be conceived what an unsavory odor such a mass must exhale, worse than an Assyrian city in the plague where the living are incompetent to bury the departed. So intolerable indeed is it regarded by some that no cupidity could persuade them to moor alongside it. Yet are the, there are those who still do it, notwithstanding the fact that the oil obtained from such subjects is of a very inferior quality, and by no means the matter of a tar of rose. Coming still nearer with the expiring breeze, we saw that the Frenchman had a second whale alongside, and this second whale seemed even more of a nosegay than the first. In truth, it turned out to be one of those problematical whales that seemed to dry up and die with a sort of prodigious dyspepsia or indigestion, leaving their defunct bodies almost entirely bankrupt of anything like oil. Nevertheless, in the proper place, we shall see that no knowing fisherman will ever turn up his nose at such a whale as this, however much he may shun blasted whales in general. The Pequod had now swept so nigh to the stranger that Stubb vowed he recognized the cutting spade entangled in the lines that were knotted around the tail of one of these whales. There's a pretty fellow now, he banteringly laughed, standing in the ship's bows. There's a jackal for ye. I know well that these crapos of Frenchmen are but poor devils in the fishery, sometimes lowering their boats for breakers, mistaking them for sperm whale spouts. Yes, and sometimes sailing from their port with a hold full of boxes of tallow candles with cases of snuffers, foreseeing that the oil they won't get won't be enough to dip the captain's wick into. Aye, we all know these things, but look ye, here's a crapo that's content with our leavings. The drugged whale there, I mean, aye, and is content too with scraping the dry bones of the other precious fish he has there. Poor devil, I say pass around a hat, someone, and let's make him a present of a little oil for dear charity's sake. For what oil he'll get from that drugged whale there won't be fit to burn in a jail, not in a condemned cell. And as for the other whale, why, I'll agree to get more ale, I'll agree to get more oil by chopping up and trying out these three masts of ours than he'll get from that bundle of bones. Though, now that I think of it, it may contain something worth a great deal more than oil. Yes, Ambergris. And I wonder now if our old man has thought of that. It's worth trying. Yes, I'm for it. And so saying, he started for the quarter deck. By this time, the faint air had become a complete calm, so that, whether or no, the Pequod was now fairly entrapped in the smell, with no hope of escaping, but it's breezing up again. Issuing from the cabin, Stubb now called his boat's crew, pulled off for the stranger. Drawing across her bow, he perceived that, in accordance with the fanciful French taste, the upper part of her stem piece was carved in the likeness of a huge drooping stalk, was painted green, and for thorns had copper spikes projecting from it here and there, the whole terminating in a symmetrical folded bulb of a bright red color. Upon her headboards, in large glittering letters, he read, Bolton de Rose, Rosebud, and or Rosebud, and this was the romantic name of this aromatic ship. Though Stubb did not understand the Bhutan part of the inscription, yet the word rose and the bulbous figurehead put together sufficiently explained the whole to him. A wooden rosebud, eh? He cried with his head to his nose. That will do very well, but how like all creation it smells. 
Now, in order to hold direct communication with the people on deck, he had to pull round the bows of the starboard side, and thus clumb close to the blasted whale and so talk over it. Arrived then at this spot with one hand still to his nose, he bawled, Bouton de Rose, ahoy! Are any of you de Pont de Roses that speak English? Yes, rejoined a Guernsey man from the bulwarks who turned out to be the chief mate. Well then, my Bouton de Rosebud, have you seen the white whale? What whale? The white whale, a sperm whale. Moby Dick, have you seen him? Never heard of such a whale. Cache la Blanche? White whale? No. Very good then. Goodbye now, and I'll call again in a minute. Then, rapidly pulling back towards the Pequod and seeing Ahab leaning over the quarterdeck whale, awaiting his report, he molded his two hands into a trumpet and shouted, No, sir, no, upon which Ahab retired and Stubb returned to the Frenchman. He now perceived that the Guernsey man, who had just gotten into the chains, was using a cutting spade, had slung his nose in a sort of bag. What the matter with your nose there, said Stubb, broke it? I wish it was broken or that I didn't have a nose at all, answered the Guernsey man, who did not seem to relish the job he was at very much. But for what are you holding yours? Oh, nothing. It's a wax nose. I have to hold it on. Fine day, ain't it? Er, rather gardeny, I should say. Throw us a bunch of posies, will ye, Bouton de Rose? When the devil's name do you want here, roared the Guernsey man, flying into a sudden passion. Oh, keep cool. Cool. Yes, that's the word. Why don't you pack those whales in ice while you're working them? But joking aside, though, do you know, Rosebud, that it's all nonsense trying to get any oil out of such whales? For that dried up one there, he hasn't got a gill in his whole carcass. I know that well enough, but do you see, the captain here won't believe it. This is his first voyage. He was a cologne manufacturer before. But come aboard and mayhap he'll believe you if he won't me, so I'll get out of this dirty scrape. Anything to oblige you, my sweet and pleasant fellow, rejoined Stubb, and with that he soon mounted to the deck. There is a queer, there a queer scene presented itself. The sailors, in tousled caps of red worsted, were getting the heavy tackles in readiness for the whales. But they worked rather slow and talked very fast and seemed in anything but good humor. All their noses upwardly projected from their faces like so many jib booms. Now and then, parts of them would drop their work and run up to the masthead to get some fresh air. Some, thinking they would catch the plague, dipped oakum in coal tar and at intervals held it to their nostrils. Others, having broken the stems of their pipes almost short off at the bowl, were vigorously puffing tobacco smoke, so that constantly filled their olfactories. Stubb was struck by a shower of outcries and anathemas proceeding from the captain's roundhouse abaft and, looking in that direction, saw a fiery face thrust up from behind a door, which was held ajar from within. This was the tormented surgeon, who, after in vain remonstrating against the proceedings of the day, had betaken himself to the captain's roundhouse. Cabinet, he called it, to avoid the pest, but still could not help yelling out his entreaties and indignations at times. Marking all of this, Stubb argued well for his scheme and turned to the Guernsey man a little ch and had a little chat with him, during which the stranger mate expressed his de detestation of the captain as a con conceited ignoramus, who brought them all into so unsavory and unprofitable a pickle. Sounding him carefully, Stubb further perceived that the Guernsey man had not the slightest suspicion concerning the ambergris. Therefore, he held his peace on that head, but otherwise was quite frank and confidential with them, so that the two concocted a little plan for both circumventing and satirizing the captain, without his at all dreaming of disrupting their sincer distrusting their sincerity. According to this little plan of theirs, the Guernsey man, under the cover of the interpreter's office, was to tell the captain what he pleased, but as coming from Stubb. And, as for Stubb, he was to utter any nonsense that should, be, that should come uppermost in him during the interview. By this time, their destined victim appeared from his cabin. He was small and dark, but rather delicate-looking man for a sea captain with a large whiskers and mustache. However, and wore a red cotton velvet vest with watch seals at his side. To this gentleman, Stubb was now politely introduced by the Guernsey man, who at once ostentatiously put on the aspect of interpreting between them. What shall I say to him first, said he. Why, well, said Stubb, eyeing the velvet vest and the watch and seals, you may as well begin by telling him that he looks sort of babyish to me, though I don't pretend to be a judge. 
He says, Monsieur, says the crazy man in French, turning to his captain, that only yesterday his ship spoke with a vessel whose captain and chief mate with six sailors had all died of a fever caught from a blasted whale they had brought alongside. Upon this, the captain started eager, desi eagerly desired to know more. What now, said the Guernsey man to first stub? Why, since he takes it so easy, tell him now that I've eyed him carefully, and I'm quite certain that he's no more fit to command a whale ship than a St. Jago monkey. In fact, tell him from me he's a baboon. He vows and declares, Monsieur, that the other whale, the dried one, is far more deadly than the blasted one. In fact, Monsieur, he conjures us, as we value our lives, to cut loose from these fish. Instantly, the captain ran forward and in a loud voice commanded his crew to desist from hoisting the cutting tackles, and at once cast loose the cables and chains confining the whales to the ship. What now, said the Guernsey man, when the captain had returned to them? Why, let me see, yes, yes, you may tell him that I've now that, in fact, tell him that I've diddled him, and uh, perhaps someone else. He says, Monsieur, that he's very happy to have been of service to us. Hearing this, the captain vowed that they were great, the grateful parties, meaning himself and the mate, and concluded by inviting Stubb down into his cabin to drink a bottle of Bordeaux. He wants you to take a glass of wine with him, said the interpreter. Thank him heartily, but tell him it's against my principles to drink with the man I've diddled. In fact, tell him I must go. He says, Monsieur, that his principles won't admit of his drinking, but that if Monsieur wants to live another day to drink, then Monsieur had best drop all four boats, pull the ship away from these whales, for it is so calm they won't drift. By this time, Stubb was over the side and getting into his boat, and hailed the Guernsey men to this effect, that, having a long tow line in his boat, he would do what he could to help them by pulling out the lighter whale of the two from the ship's side. While the Frenchman's boats then were engaged in towing the ship one way, Stubb benevolently towed away at his whale the other way, ostentatiously slacking out a most unusually long tow line. Presently, the breeze sprang up, and Stubb feigned to cast off from the whale, hoisting his boats, the Frenchman soon increased his distance, while the Pequod slid in between him and Stubb's whale. Whereupon Stubb quickly pulled the floating body and hailed the Pequod to give notice of his intentions, at once proceeded to reap the fruit of his unrighteous cunning. Seizing his sharp boat spade, he commenced in an excavation in the body, a little behind the side fin. You would almost have thought he was digging a cellar there in the sea, and what at length his spade struck against gaunt ribs, it was like turning old Roman tiles and pottery buried in fat English loam. His, body's cr his boat's crew were all in high excitement, eagerly helping their chief, and looking as anxious as gold hunters. And all the time, numberless fowls were diving and ducking and screaming and yelling and fighting around them. Stubb was beginning to look disappointed, especially at the, the horrible nosegay increased, when suddenly, from the other heart of this plague, there stole a faint stream of perfume, which flowed through the tide of bad smells without being absorbed by it, as one river will flow into and then along with another, without all blending with it for a time. I have it, I have it, cried Stubb with delight, striking something in the subterranean regions. A purse, a purse! Dropping his spade, he thrust both hands in and drew out handfuls of something that looked like ripe Windsor soap or rich mottled old cheese, very unctuous and savory withal. You might easily dent it with your thumb. It is of a hue between yellow and ash color, and this, good friends, is amber grease, worth a gold guinea an ounce to any druggist. Some six handfuls were obtained, but more was unavoidably lost at sea, and still more, perhaps, might have been secured were it not for impatient Ahab's loud commands to stub to desist and come on board, else the ship would bid them goodbye. So this is the end of chapter 91. And so I met a ship called the Rosebud, which was surrounded by stinking, rotting whales. So this is, this is total irony here. And so irony is where there's a mismatch between what is said and what is or what is expected and what is. So you would expect that the ship named Rosebud would smell nice, but no, it doesn't. It's surrounded by the rotting whales. And it's headed by someone who made cologne. So this person made cologne and then decided, hey, I'm gonna go out and be captain of a whale ship. And he had no experience and he probably funded most of it. 
And he probably would have been far better served to stay on land and just, you know, like send the boat out and wait for it to come back with money or with oil to sell for money. But no, he went out in the boat and not knowing what he was doing, being a total novice at this. Um, saw these two whales that floating and he pulled them up. How he happened upon two of them so quick, I don't know, but he happened upon these two whales. One of them, Stubb had killed like a week early, two weeks earlier, or severely injured a couple of weeks earlier, and then ended up floating her up to the surface. So that's not good. Uh, and the other one, he just is small, was kind of thin and sickly. Uh, so there wouldn't probably be much oil in it. And now we get to the real irony of the situation. Amber grease is used to make perfume. That is its sole use. And it is insanely expensive. I mean, it's like thousands of dollars an ounce. Uh, even nowadays, uh, there are some, they have managed to manufacture some chemical replacements for it. So practice, you know, with various different chemicals, you can go and make essentially the same thing that the ambergris is and they've made it and but still you know the natural source is still used high-end perfume chanel number no. five one of the base scents in chanel number no. five is ambergris and ambergris kind of smells bad actually um and it's made by the digestion of sperm whales when sperm whales eat giant squids something happens with whatever happens in the stomach of sperm whales and whatever it is that the giant squids are made up. And it's only some sperm whales that make this. So you have a, you know, so you have the sperm whale and it's only some sperm whales make this. So, you know, over the years they found that, you know, the, you know, after, you know, hunting sperm whales for, you know, decades, some of them have this in it. And sometimes the sperm whales vomited out. So you often find chunks of it just sort of floating in the ocean. And it can float in the ocean for years and it changes color and hardens. And every four or five years, you see a story about a beachcomber stumbling upon something the size of a loaf of bread. A lumpy, foul-smelling blob. And the people who know what it is, they're like, ah, and they go and they find the appropriate people to sell it to. And it gets, they get, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars from something the size of a loaf of bread that weighs five or six pounds. And so every few years you hear news stories about this happening. So here you have someone, the ship, the commander of the Rosebud, the, the captain of the Rosebud made cologne and so he should know ambergris and he should know ambergris comes from sperm whales. And I don't know if I were him, I would almost skip blubbering and just, you know, go straight for the ambergris. Um, or definitely make that part of any, in any captured whale, but he's too incompetent for that. Now, Rosebud is probably best known in popular culture as as the slave from Citizen Kane. So in the movie Citizen Kane, classic movie, Orson Welles, kind of overrated, uh, but it it has it has a lot of really great artistic things about it. And the whole movie is about Kane's last words. Charles Foster Kane is the main character of the movie, not really a hero. He's the protagonist. And so his last words were Rosebud. And you go and it's like, okay, what's Rosebud? What's Rosebud? And then at the end of the movie, you find out that it was his sled from childhood. And there's whole bunches of backstories about uh, Citizen Kane that it was actually a... Um, it was actually satirizing a newspaper publisher 
who is still alive. And there's a saying, you don't pick fights of people who buy ink by the barrel. And so the movie just got, like, panned in the papers. Uh, who was the guy's name? Hurst. Hurst. William Randolph Hearst. So the movie poked fun at William Randolph Hearst because Charles Foster Kane was a m newspaper publisher and William Randolph Hearst. Hearst Media is still a huge name in printing. So William Randolph Hearst just total media tycoon I, incredibly rich ran all sorts of newspapers back when newspapers were the only game in town for news and so you know he picked a fight with you know Orson Welles picked a fight with uh, picked a fight with William Randolph first and so the whole movie went to Rosebud being this sled and there are some people who say, oh, Citizen Kane is, you know, here he was. He was trying to get back to his roots, the innocence of his childhood. But the thing is, is that when I looked at it, it's like, you know, there's different types of sleds. And there's a toboggan, which you can, which is long and flat. And you kind of steer it a little bit by leaning and so you lean left and you go left, you lean right, you go right, kind of, sort of. But his sled was a different type of sled. It was a runner sled. And one of the cool things about runner sleds is there's a little steering handle in the front. So if you take the steering handle and you push it, it turns the runners. So they're much more maneuverable. I mean, so you can go around things. I mean, when I was a little kid, I had a runner sled. And I would, like, you know, go right toward a tree and then swerve right around it. Because, you know, that was fun. And everyone else hated the runner sleds because they, like, dug up the snow. Everything else had, like, the flat bottom. And for the most part, weren't steerable. But, you know, I could steer, which was awesome. So, anyway, he had a runner sled. And it's like, no, the entire movie is about control. Because... Citizen Kane was all about, you know, he was controlling everything. He was buying people. He was firing people, firing people. And, you know, the they said it was about him wanting to be loved and appreciated. And it's like, no. No, it was him controlling things. Which is really funny because Orson Welles is a control freak. So in a lot of ways, Citizen Kane is more autobiographical of, of Orson Welles. It's more about Orson Welles than it is about William Randolph Hearst. So that's, that's a little bit of movie critique. And I don't think anyone would agree with my philosophy there. But because the sled was a last minute addition, because the prop that was originally going to be broke. But, uh... It was originally supposed to be a snow globe. And the snow globe broke. But anyway, the sled theory really kind of works there. Um, and that is chapter 91.